Okay, in today's lecture, we're going to cover the first part of the section 4.4 material on coordinate systems. Uh, now, in our last section, 4.3, uh, we had uh, introduced the idea of a basis for a vector space. And one reason that we might be interested in finding a basis for a vector space is to impose a sort of coordinate system on that vector space. Uh, so in this section, uh, we'll introduce the idea of a coordinate system uh, imposed on a vector space uh, by an associated basis B. And we'll see that if a basis for a space contains n vectors, then that coordinate system uh, that we impose uh, by the indicated basis will make our vector space act like Rn. Uh, and Rn is a familiar vector space, uh, so we'll see that uh, the results that we have for uh, vectors, uh, vector spaces in Rn uh, can be generalized to vector spaces V uh, by making use of this coordinate system. So uh, one result that we'll start by introducing uh, will uh, guarantee the existence of such a coordinate system. Uh, so this is theorem 4.7 from your textbook, which is called the Unique Representation Theorem. And here's what it says. If we have uh, some basis B consisting of n vectors, uh, and this is a basis for the vector space V, then for each vector x in our vector space, there exists a unique set of scalars, c1 through cn, such that x can be written as a linear combination of the basis vectors uh, with those weights. Um, so there's two parts to establishing this theorem. The first is that there exists such a set of scalars. Uh, now, in this uh, theorem, we're uh, given a basis, b, and by definition of a basis, uh, it's a set of vectors which spans uh, a vector space V. So we can start by saying uh, since the basis B spans uh, our vector space V, uh, that means that there exists, or there exist uh, scalars. Uh, let's call them C1 through Cn such that uh, our vector x uh, can be written as a linear combination of the basis vectors uh, for any vector x in our vector space. Uh, so this is the definition of a spanning set for a vector spaces. Uh, any vector within our space can be written as a linear combination of uh, the vectors in our spanning set. So the existence follows directly from the definition of a basis. Uh, now the second part of this theorem is to determine that that set of scalars C1 through Cn is unique. Uh, so to prove uniqueness, let us suppose that there's another representation. Uh, so here, uh, suppose that our vector x also has the representation uh, given by x is equal to, uh, let's use different scalars, say d1 times b1 plus d2 times b2 up through dn uh, times bn. So suppose there's different scalars. Uh, such that x can be written as a linear combination of these same basis vectors. Then, uh, by subtracting these two expressions that we have for x, uh, we have the following. Uh, so taking our two vectors, x and x, and subtracting them, uh, we get the zero vector as x minus x. And now subtracting these two representations that we found, uh, we have c1 minus d1 times b1 uh, plus c2 minus d2 uh, times b2 up through cn minus dn times the basis vector bn. 
And so now what we have is the following. We have a linear combination of these basis vectors, b1 up through bn, is equal to the zero vector. But now we know that these uh, basis vectors must be linearly independent. That's one of the definitions of a basis, is that the vectors within that basis are linearly independent. So the only way that a linear combination of these basis vectors can equal zero is if each of these weights is equal to zero. That's the definition of linearly independent vectors. It's the only linear combination which yields the zero vector is if you take all of your weights equal to zero. Uh, so we can say, um, since uh, the basis B is linearly independent, uh, that means that all weights must be zero. Uh, so that is uh, the C sub I weights have to equal the D sub I weights uh, for all values of I1 through N. So we've shown that these uh, weights, which we're using to write X as a linear combination of our basis vectors, uh, <clears throat> is unique. Uh, so this establishes our unique representation theorem. Um, and uh, this is critical throughout this section uh, in specifying that there is a unique set of scalars uh, for any given vector uh, to write that vector as a linear combination of these basis vectors. Uh, so now that we've established that, let's introduce some terminology and show how a, a basis for a vector space will introduce a coordinate system for that space. Uh, so in this definition, let's suppose that we have B uh, as the set of vectors B1 through Bn, and this is a basis for the vector space V, and X is some uh, vector in that space. So we would say the coordinates of that vector X relative to the basis B or sometimes called the B coordinates or basis coordinates of X uh, as the weights C1 through Cn such that X is a linear combination of the basis vectors with those weights, uh, which we know are unique by the unique representation theorem. Uh, so if C1 through Cn are the basis coordinates of X, then the vector in Rn, uh, whose entries are those um, uh, basis coordinates of x, uh, is written as uh, x in brackets with a subscript b for our basis. And this vector is called the coordinate vector of x relative to the basis b, or the b coordinate or basis coordinate vector of x. So what we see is that a basis uh, will associate with any vector x in our space, a vector rn uh, called the coordinate vector of x. And this mapping uh, where x is uh, mapped to its uh, coordinate vector relative to the basis is called the coordinate mapping determined by the basis b. All right. So let's look at some examples uh, working with uh, coordinates um, of a vector uh, relative to a given basis. So in this first example, we are asked to find the vector x in R2, uh, which is determined by the coordinate vector. x sub b is 8, negative 5, uh, where the basis b consists of the two vectors here. Um, so in order to find the vector x, which has the indicated coordinate vector relative to this basis, we're going to take these coordinates of that vector as the weights of our linear combination of these two basis vectors. That is, we take our first coordinate, which was 8, times our first basis vector, 4, 5. Then we add the second coordinate, which was negative 5, 
times our second basis vector, 6, 7. So let's see what we have. We have x is equal to, uh, multiplying our first vector by 8, we have 32, 40. Uh, minus, multiplying our second vector by 5, we have 30 and 35. So our difference, uh, the vector x is 2, 5. So this would be the vector x in R2 uh, that has the indicated coordinate vector relative to the given basis. So let's look at another one. Uh, here we are asked to find the vector x now in space, R3, uh, which is determined by the coordinate vector x sub b is negative 4, 8, negative 7, uh, relative to the indicated basis here. Um, so as with our first example, the vector x that we're interested in would have these coordinates, negative 4, 8, and 7, as the weights in the linear combination using these basis vectors b1, b2, and b3. So we can take uh, negative 4 times our first basis vector, negative 1, 2, 0, uh, plus our second coordinate, 8, times the second basis vector, 3, negative 5, 2, uh, plus our third coordinate, negative 7, times the third basis vector, 4, negative 7, 3. So x here is, uh, our first vector is 4, negative 8, 0, plus our second vector times 8, we have 24, negative 40, and 16. And then plus, uh, distributing the negative 7, we have negative 28, positive 49, and negative 21. Uh, so x is the sum of these three vectors. So for our first coordinate, we have 28 minus 28 is 0. Uh, second coordinate, we have negative 48 plus 49 is 1. And our third coordinate is 16 minus 21, or negative 5. So these first two examples illustrate uh, that if we have a basis assigned for our vector space, uh, and we know the coordinates of a vector relative to that basis, we can find any vector uh, given those coordinates. Uh, so let's look at some other examples where we'll move in the opposite direction, um, where we're trying to define uh, coordinates for a vector in Rn uh, relative to a given basis. So here uh, we can say when a basis B for Rn is fixed, then the basis coordinate vector for a given vector x uh, can be easily found, as we'll show in our next couple of examples. Uh, so in this first example, we are asked to find the coordinate vector x sub b uh, of the vector 4, 0 relative to the basis b uh, given here. So to find the coordinates for this vector, uh, that is the b coordinates or basis coordinates of uh, the vector x. Uh, well, they must satisfy the following equation. Uh, the first coordinate, c1, times our first basis vector, which is 1, negative 2, plus the second coordinate, c2, times our second basis vector, 5, negative 6, uh, must be equal to the given vector x, which was 4, 0. Uh, so we can write this vector equation uh, in matrix form as follows. Uh, so we have first column of 1, negative 2, second column 5, negative 6, uh, which we're then multiplying that um, matrix times a vector of coefficients, c1, c2, and that must equal the vector x for 0. Uh, so to solve for the coordinates c1 and c2, well, there's a number of ways we could do it. Uh, one way would be to make use of an augmented matrix. Uh, so let us consider the 
augmented matrix uh, corresponding to this system. So we have uh, 1, 5, negative 2, negative 6 augmented with our vector for 0. And by performing row reduction, we can solve for C1 and C2. Uh, so in my first step, I could take uh, row 2 plus 2 times row 1. So my first row will remain 1, 5, 4. And my second row becomes uh, 2 minus 2 is 0. 10 minus 6 is 4. And then 8 plus 0 is 8. Uh, so from here, I see I could uh, multiply my uh, second row through by one fourth, and that makes my second row uh, zero one two, and my first row I'm going to leave alone for right now. Uh, so then in this last step. Uh, I'm going to eliminate the 5 in that top right entry uh, by taking row 1 minus 5 times row 2, which makes my first row 1, 0, and then negative 10 uh, plus 4 is negative 6. And then my second row is 0, 1, 2. Uh, so we have the coordinates C1 and C2 are negative 6, and 2, uh, which means that the coordinate vector for x relative to the basis b that we were given is the vector negative 6, 2. So for a given vector, uh, we can find the uh, coordinate vector relative to a given basis. All right. Uh, so let's look at another example of this, maybe in a higher dimension. So in this example, we are asked again to find the coordinate vector of x relative to the basis b uh, for this vector x and the given basis shown here. All right. So as with our last example, the b coordinates... of uh, x must satisfy the equation, uh, the first coordinate, c1, times our first basis vector, 1, 0, 3, plus the second coordinate, c2, times the second basis vector, 2, 1, 8, plus our third coordinate, c3, times the third basis vector, 1, negative 1, 2, uh, must equal the given vector x, uh, 3, negative 5, 4. Uh, so as with the previous example, we could express this system in matrix form and then write it as an augmented matrix. Um, so let us consider uh, the corresponding augmented matrix. So here our first column is 1, 0, 3. Second column is 2, 1, 8. Third column is 1, negative 1, 2. And we are augmenting with a 3, negative 5, 4. All right. Uh, so in this first step, while I have a 1 for the leading entry in my first row, I'm going to use that to eliminate the 3 as the leading entry in my uh, third row by taking row 3 minus 3 times row 1. And in this same step, I'm going to use the leading entry in my second row of 1 uh, to eliminate the 2 that appears above it in my first row uh, by taking row 1 minus 2 times row 2. So let's see what our first row becomes. We have uh, 1, negative 2 plus 2 is 0, uh, 2 plus 1 is 3, and then augmented with, uh, I've got 10 plus 3 would be 13. Uh, my second row, I'm going to leave alone. 
and my third row uh, performing the indicated operation. I have negative three plus three is zero, uh, negative six plus eight is two, negative three plus two is negative one, and negative nine plus four gives me negative five. Okay, uh, so now my first column is exactly what I want. Uh, one on the diagonal, zeros below it. Uh, in my second row, I'm gonna use the leading one uh, to kill off the two that appears below it in the third row. So to do that, I can take row three minus two times row two. So my first row is one, zero, three, 13. Uh, my second row is zero, one, negative one, negative five. And my third row becomes zero, zero, uh, one, and 10 minus five is five. So in my last step, I'm going to use the pivot one uh, in my third row to eliminate the positive three and negative one that appear above it uh, by taking row one minus three times row three or row two plus row three. So my first row uh, becomes one, zero, zero, negative two. My second row becomes zero, one, zero, zero. And my third row is zero, zero, one, five. So we find uh, using our row reduction that the first coordinate C1 is negative two, second coordinate is zero, and our third coordinate is five. Uh, and so the coordinate vector for X relative to the given basis B is the vector negative two, zero, five in R3. All right. Uh, so now that we've seen how to find these uh, coordinate vectors uh, with a, a given basis, let's look at how these coordinate vectors uh, can be used to define uh, a new coordinate system uh, for Rn um, and think about a graphical interpretation of these coordinates. So uh, what we've been showing is that a coordinate system on a set or a vector space uh, would consist of a one-to-one -one mapping of the points in that set into uh, R, uh, R sub n, or R n. Uh, so let's take a look at this uh, graphical interpretation. So suppose that we have a vector x uh, given as 4, 5. And in part a, uh, we are asked to find the coordinate vector x uh, sub e for the vector x relative to the standard basis e, uh, whose vectors e1 and e2 are the standard basis vectors for R2. Those are the columns of the two by two identity matrix. Uh, and then sketch the vector X and the standard basis vectors E1 and E2. Um, so first to find our coordinate vector, as with the previous examples, uh, we would let C1 times E1, which is one zero, uh, plus C2 times E2, which is 0, 1, equal to the given vector X, which is 4, 5. Uh, now, in this case, we can see clearly uh, the first weight, C1, must be 4, and C2 uh, must be 5. So it's easy if we're making use of the standard basis vectors uh, to see what our uh, weight should be. So we find the coordinate vector of x relative to the standard basis e is uh, the vector 4, 5, which is the exact same as the vector x. Uh, so then we're asked to sketch this vector x along with our standard basis vectors. Uh, so here, the vector x was the vector 4, 5, So its representation 
has its initial point at the origin and its terminal point at 4, 5. And we're also asked to draw the standard basis vectors, E1 and E2. Now E1 uh, is the vector 1, 0, so its representation is shown here. And E2 is the vector 0, 1, uh, so its representation given here. Um, so let's think about what these uh, coordinates in our coordinate vector represent. Here we're given the coordinates 4 and 5. So what these represent uh, geometrically are scaling values for the vectors E1 and E2. So our first coordinate, 4, uh, means that we're supposed to take 4 times the vector E1. So multiplying this vector by 4, it just uh, scales the length of that vector. So we have here 4 times E1. And the second coordinate, 5, means we're supposed to scale E2 by 5 units. So multiplying by 5, we scale the length by 5, and we have the vector shown here. And so we see that x is the sum of those two vectors using the parallelogram law. x was written as the sum 4e1 plus 5e2. So in the case that we're using the standard uh, basis vectors for R2, uh, the coordinate vectors are the exact entries of x, 4 and 5. We move 4 units to the right, 5 units upward. So let's see what happens if we use a different basis. How would that affect our coordinate system? Uh, so in the second part of this problem, we're asked to find the coordinate vector uh, x sub b for the vector x relative to the basis b, uh, whose vectors b1 and b2 are given. And then again, we want to sketch the vector x uh, along with the basis vectors b1 and b2. Um, so as with part A and our previous examples, to find the coordinates, uh, we're going to let C1 times B1, which was 2, 1, uh, plus C2 times B2, which was negative 1, 1, equal to the given vector uh, X, which was 4, 5. Uh, so we could solve for C1 and C2 using an augmented matrix or uh, any other approach. Uh, and to save ourselves a little bit of time here, I'll give you the values of C1 and C2. Uh, C1 is equal to 3, and C2 is equal to 2. Uh, so the coordinate vector for x relative to the basis b is the vector 3, 2. So let's think about how these coordinates uh, can be used to represent the vector x uh, given this basis. Um, so we can see this from our sketch. So we start by sketching the vector x, uh, which was the vector 4, 5. So we have the same vector shown here that we had in part a. and we're asked to sketch our basis vectors b1 and b2. Now b1 is the vector 2, 1. So we have b1 shown here, two units to the right, one unit upward. And b2 uh, is the vector negative 1, positive 1. So the vector shown here is our second basis vector. So let's think how these uh, coordinates 3 and 2 uh, are defining this vector x relative to this basis. Uh, so the first coordinate 3 uh, means that we're supposed to take 3 times the vector b1. So let's look at 3 times b1. If we triple the length of that vector uh, we would have the vector 6 3 so we have here uh, the vector 3 times b1, 
and the second coordinate, 2, means we're supposed to uh, double the length of B2, or take 2 times B2. Uh, so we see that our vector x here is the vector defined as the sum of those scalar multiples of b1 and b2 using the parallelogram law. If we form the other two adjacent sides of that parallelogram, we have the uh, following. Let me draw this a little more precise here. A little messy the way I've got it. All right. Um, so this basis is forming a non-standard uh, coordinate system for R2 uh, in the following way. If we think about a grid formed here, we have um, a line corresponding to 1 times B1 as the following line, or if we took 2 times B1, we would have a terminal point forming this line, or 3 times B1 would give us this right-hand edge or zero times B1 gives us that lower left edge. Uh, now similarly, we have a line determined by one times B2, or two times B2, or zero times B2. So we see this sort of grid emerging. Uh, if we think about sums of scalar multiples of the vectors B1 and B2, and our vector X, could be represented relative to that grid as this point, 3, 2. We're moving 1, 2, 3 units in the B1 direction and 2 units upward. So we see by extending that green grid uh, infinitely in both directions, we have uh, a way to represent any vector in the plane uh, as um, uh, in terms of those basis vectors B1 and B2. Uh, so a little graphical interpretation of what these coordinates or coordinate vectors are representing. All right. Um, so in the uh, last few examples, the matrix that we were making use of uh, is changing the uh, B coordinates of a vector X into the standard coordinates uh, for x. So uh, an analogous change of coordinates can be carried out in Rn uh, for any basis b, uh, whose vectors are b1 through bn. So if we let p sub b be the matrix whose columns are our basis vectors b1 through bn, then the vector equation, x is equal to c1, b1, plus c2, b2, up through cn, bn, uh, is equivalent to the matrix equation, x is equal to uh, p sub b times the x, uh, or the b coordinate vector of x. So the matrix p sub b, which we're making use of, whose columns are the basis vectors, is called the change of coordinates matrix uh, from the basis b to the standard basis in Rn. Uh, so left multiplication of a coordinate vector by pb uh, will transform that coordinate vector into a vector x uh, in Rn. Okay. So uh, for our first example, working with this change of coordinates matrix, uh, we are asked to find the change of coordinates matrix from the basis B given here uh, to the standard basis in Rn. All right. Uh, so by definition, the change of coordinate matrix is the matrix which has the basis vectors as its columns. Uh, so here, our change of coordinate matrix, P sub B, is the 3 by 3 matrix whose columns are these basis vectors. All right. Um, so immediately we have our answer here. Uh, so 
let's look at how we could make use of that change of coordinates matrix. Uh, now we know the columns of the change of coordinate matrix P sub B uh, form a basis for R in. By definition, they're basis vectors uh, as our columns. So uh, that means that this change of coordinate matrix PB is invertible by the invertible matrix theorem, since its columns are linearly independent. And so uh, if we were to consider the inverse of that change of coordinate matrix, left multiplication of that inverse matrix will convert uh, a vector x into its beta uh, or b coordinate vector. So that is the uh, coordinate vector of x relative to the basis b can be found by taking the inverse of our change of coordinate matrix uh, times the vector x. Um, okay, now uh, since this matrix is an invertible matrix itself, uh, we know that the coordinate mapping, uh, which is taking x to its coordinate vector, uh, given by the, uh, or relative to the basis B, that mapping must be a one-to-one -one linear transformation from Rn onto Rn. So since the inverse matrix, which is defining this mapping, uh, is invertible, the invertible matrix theorem uh, tells us that that mapping is one-to-one -one and onto, uh, and it's linear since it's represented by matrix multiplication. So this property of uh, the coordinate mapping is also true for a general vector space, not just Rn, that has a basis. All right, um, so let's take a look at how we can use this uh, change of coordinate matrix or its inverse. Uh, so here we are told to use an inverse matrix to find the coordinate vector for x relative to the basis B uh, for the vector 2, 0, and the basis B given here. All right, uh, so we need to find the inverse of the change of coordinates matrix. So we first need to find that matrix. Uh, so here, the change of coordinates matrix uh, from B to the standard basis is the matrix P sub B, whose columns are our basis vectors. In this case, four, five, and six, seven. Now we need the inverse of that matrix, uh, which means that we need to find its determinant if we're going to use the formula for the inverse of a two by two matrix. Uh, so here our determinant would be um, 28, minus um, 30, so we have negative 2, uh, which is certainly non-zero, as our determinant. Uh, and so the inverse of this change of coordinate matrix is given by 1 over our determinant, so negative 1 half, times the two by two matrix we get by interchanging our diagonal entries of the matrix and taking the negative of the off diagonal entries, negative six and negative five. Um, so multiplying this matrix by our negative one half, we have negative seven halves, uh, three, five halves and negative two. All right, uh, so our coordinate vector for x relative to the basis b is found by taking the inverse of that change of coordinate uh, matrix times the given vector x. Uh, so in this example, we have the matrix negative 7 halves, 3, 5 halves, and negative 2 times our vector x, which was 2, 0, uh, 
So let's see what we have. We have uh, negative 7 and 5 for uh, the coordinate vector uh, for x uh, associated or relative to that basis b. All right.